Hello, book readers. I'm glad you're here. Today we are going over the Sarah J. Mass interview with Christina Lauren that I listened to last night, and I'm losing my ever-loving mind. This is your spoiler alert. We're talking Sarah J. Mass books. If you haven't read them, don't watch this video. Um, I am holding nothing back. We're going unscripted today because I have so many thoughts. First of all, she looked so beautiful. She looked so amazing. She was looking so good. It was great to see her. She's not out in the world a lot, so we don't get to see much of Sarah. And it was wonderful to see her. She looked so beautiful. So pretty much Christina Lauren asked um, their followers for questions that we wanted to hear. You know, she can only give us what her publisher will let her say. So I was not expecting a lot because of that, but I was very surprised with what we got. They mostly just talked about her writing experiences and they talked about Crescent City a lot because yesterday is when the book to paperback published and yesterday was September 26th. And then talking about House of Flame and Shadow coming out in January. And then just a, a few other things sprinkled in, but it was mostly about that. So they started off right away asking her, so give us an overview of Crescent City for anybody who hasn't read it. And she was very overwhelmed with that question. She was like, I don't even know where to start. There's so many parts of it. Um, but basically she just described it as a mix of urban fantasy, paranormal romance, fantasy, like a fantasy world mixed with a modern world with like a, a bad snarky heroine who goes on a huge journey of healing and self-discovery and some hot dudes and some spicy times. Those were the ways that she described it. Then they asked her if she ever looks at theories, if she's ever looks um, at what the fandom is talking about. And she said, no, she does not. She's very separated from that, which you can tell by some of her answers. And it was cracking me up. I was dying. Basically, she said she stays in her creative bubble and doesn't look at any of that. She says sometimes friends will send her like screenshots of crazy theories or something. So she'll get things that way. But otherwise, she says she has three apps on her phone, the New York Times crossword puzzle, Solitaire, and Mahjong, and that's it. She does not go down the rabbit holes. Then I thought it was so interesting that she described to us her process of writing Crescent City because... I have not heard this before, that she's been writing it for years and years and that it's a years long process as are all her books. But with Crescent City, it was like her fun project that she started one day in the middle of still writing the Throne of Glass series. It just came to her. She talked about how she was on an airplane listening to a certain piece of music and it just came to her like the scene, the last scene of Bryce where she's like at the gates and the world is destroyed around her. She said that just image just came to her and then she just went with it from there. Like she said on that plane ride, she listened to that same piece of music over and over again and just kept imagining this world. And it is just so fascinating to me to see the way her brain works because I knew it was something phenomenal just from reading it. You know, it's insane the way that breadcrumbs are, are laid and that how beautifully it's written and these character arcs. So just hearing her describe it was so cool. But also she said she grew up in New York City and so living in a city and growing up as a kid in a city kind of inspired a lot of Crescent City. And she said when she was on the airplane and this came to her, she said she burst into tears. And <laughs> she said she knew it was a modern city and that like she saw Bryce and she saw Danica and like Danica's voice talking to her from the dead. Like these are the origins of Crescent City. And then she just went with it from there. Basically she started with Bryce and then the best friend that was dead and a hot angel dude with the backstory and then she worked in reverse from there so it was so fascinating but then she just talked about how she doesn't go out very often she stays home and she is thinking about her stories or writing her stories because when she gets an idea her idea of fun is sitting down and writing the story down so she would be in the middle of writing Throne of Glass or Akatar, and when she was done with that for the day then her escape was going and writing Crescent City so was so funny to me but she just said it was over the course of years and years and it was a side project and then when Throne of Glass was wrapping up she kept coming back to it of like what do I want to write next she kept coming back to this 
project, her fun project. So they asked her, how does she keep track of the details? Does she have a mass verse Bible or does she have some sort of system? And she said that her publisher has an official Bible that they reference frequently, but also that she has a genius editor who remembers details and even specific lines from all her books and then also it just exists inside her head is what she said um, she says she has a terrible mem memory for like everyday things but her book worlds they live inside her head she was saying her editor like for flame and shadow read something and said that line sounds fam seems familiar to me like we might have a line like this in another book and so she has also an incredible memory and then they asked her about Hunt and his backstory and his origin. So they said, will we find out more about his origin stories? She said, you will learn more about Hunt and where he came from in the next book. As for his well-being, I make no promises. And then she said, I'm not saying anything about anything because that's a spoiler, but we'll get more of his story, but she can't make us any promises for his well-being the anxiety like i instantly started sweating i was like what is she going to do to us i'm nervous i'm very nervous i saw somebody's theory of like how the last line of hunts like about hunt in book two was and then hunt thought nothing after um Rigelus put the crown on his head and this person said like hear me out what if it like has taken his memory and he's not gonna remember her and I was like well, no like this is why I don't sit and like think about um theories because it just eats me alive like I'm just like what story is she gonna tell us I don't do a lot of theories but when I read that one I was like no because she goes on later to say like poor Hunt, he has quite the journey ahead of him or something. Oh yeah, she said, poor Hunt, he's in for a journey. I swear, Sarah, I swear if something happens to him, I don't think he's gonna die. Um, I just think he's gonna have a struggle, which will be fascinating to read and I can't wait, but okay. Also, she said, when I was working on book two, I thought, what is the worst thing that could happen to him? Okay, because Christina Lauren, Christina and Lauren asked her, like, how did you end up putting another slave tattoo on him? Like, that was so horrible. How could you do that to him? And she said, like, I was trying to think of what is the end going to be for him? Um, because she said initially she had him getting his wings cut off again and then her editor was like okay but what would be worse than that and she said well worse for Hunt would be getting another slave tattoo you know like being enslaved again and they're like okay yeah let's do that I was like oh like why are we doing this to the characters but of course like that's what we all love is the drama and you know, the intensity, but so it was just funny to hear her process of like how we came to <laughs> doing the worst to him was actually thinking, what is the worst we could do to him? <laughs> also, yes, I'm wearing my Chiefs era sweatshirt, which I had for the record before the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey entendre because I am an avid Chiefs fan, hardcore Chiefs fan. And so now it's very appropriate for the current status of culture. <laughs> So we'll see if they crash and burn or if they last. I, I'm still not convinced it's not a publicity stunt. Okay. And they asked her about, like, are we going to hear more about the Autumn King and the connections with that? Um, and I was like, oh, who's the Autumn King? <laughs> like, it took me a minute. She said, yes, you're going to get more. She said he's become one of her favorite characters to write because he's so horrible and he's someone who's capable of doing the right thing, but he just doesn't do it. And he's like a very messed up, horrible person. <laughs> and so she said like hitting him against Bryce and Rune, she said she enjoys writing the drama and like when Bryce sticks it to him. Um, so that was interesting. But listen, guys, when she said this, when she said, I enjoy pitting him against Bryce and Rune. And when she said Rune, she grimaced Oh, I swear to you, she grimaced like I, my note says, why is she sad and grimace when she talk about Rune? 
<laughs> what is my grammar? Like I was trying to go fast. Oh, so she grimaced and then I was like, what, what is happening? And because she said that, then they asked her about silly theory that somebody had written about what Rune uses his first light for, which was kind of off topic, but then she goes, now I feel bad about where Rune is. Oh gosh, sweet Rune. I'll leave it at that. No, Sarah, you will not leave it at that, okay? Like I have six months until I'm gonna find out. I just pack it up in a box and ship it to January because I cannot. My notes literally right here says no, all capitals. No, Sarah, no. Okay. I'm sorry, I am so worked up because I just love these books. It's so much fun. So then she talked about um, when she's writing drafts and she was kind of hesitant about what she wanted to share, but she said when she was writing this book, House of Flame and Shadow, that she was going through some things and things just weren't going well. She said she wrote an entire first draft and she didn't like it. She was meh. She was like, meh about it. She said, she said she turned it in and she knew she hadn't found the right story. 200,000 words later and it wasn't good enough for her. She said she's very intense about her writing. She wants to put out the best possible thing. And so she finished it, turned it in, and then she said, nope. And she threw it in the trash and completely started over. Like that is so overwhelming. But she said that's why it's taken longer between books not only did she have a baby and she took a little break after the baby then she said she trashed an entire draft and had to start over i'm just you know like i'm so compassionate i'm like it's okay sarah like i'm okay now i'm sorry i complained two rounds of edits and then she threw it out so started over again sat down tuned out the world she said and then over the course of four or five weeks she wrote a brand new draft she said she finally found the story that made it all come together how she wanted a few of the scenes stayed but most of it is completely new from that first draft um she said i'm not afraid of the hard work and saying it's not good enough because i know an opportunity to do better is there she said i have to completely love it and believe in it so she's very passionate about it and you can tell in her writing and then she gave an example of I was talking about the book that she's writing right now which she tells us about in a minute and she said she spent a whole day writing something and then by the end of the day she was like this is dumb <laughs> she's like she said i saved it but i knew it wasn't like it wasn't even good enough for bonus scene materials what she said so just part of the process of refining um, the story. They asked her about like how hard was it to keep the secret of the Crescent City 2 ending um, because they were like that had to be mind-blowing and then they said that Jody Pico had messaged them, Christina and Lauren, Jody Pico had messaged them to say please ask this to Sarah. I want to know if she knew she was writing toward that baller ending all along or when did she decide to crash the worlds together and then Lauren I think it was Lauren. No, no, it was Christina said, added to that and said in the throne of glass, when Aelin closed the word gates and she got glimpses of those worlds, you know, where she sees fair and resand and then it keeps going. Um, she said, you said in, in the past that you were very deep in the process of Crescent City when you were also writing that. So she said, when you had the world's crossing idea, like, are you a crazy genius where all these bread breadcrumbs just came together or was it, inten it intentional all those years ago? And Sarah answers by saying when she was writing that scene with Aelin going through, since she was in the middle of writing Crescent City, like she knew she wanted to show Rhysand and Feyre. And she was like, I might as well put this world in because I love it. She did not say if like she already planned on publishing that story, but she definitely wrote Crescent City into that scene on purpose. Um, and then she said about the end of Crescent City 2, she said, I've known for a while. She said, I knew that the worlds overlapped before when Aelin was crashing through all those worlds. She said, I'd already daydreamed Crescent City, knew she wanted the Akritar world to be spotlighted. So they, so then she had her go through Crescent City too. And then she said after she had sold Crescent City to a publisher that she got the idea of them all being connected. And then she said she had a moment of like, what the out of the blue, just an all of the sudden epiphany. And she said it was an out of body experience. She was like, felt like I was out of my body when it came to me of like, 
I have got to do this. I have got to write this, um, which is how I also felt reading it. So props, Sarah. So when she had that epiphany, then in Crescent City One, she started planting seeds on purpose. And she said it was very hard writing towards that. Um, but she said when she wrote the scene where, you know, hi, welcome, I'm Reese. She said she burst into tears. Um, so she was like, it's all my favorite characters coming together. Uh, so many emotions. And she said it's still one of the favorite parts that she has ever, ever written. Then they asked, are we going to get some more POVs in Flame and Shadow? And she said, I'm not saying anything about anything. She said, you'll see some Akatar world. And she, and they asked her if it picks up right where it left off. And she said it basically picks up very close to that scene. She's like, it's not that exact scene, but very close to that. And then they started doing rapid fire questions with her and they were like, answer it if you want to answer it you can answer it fast you can answer it longer or you can say pass if you can't give this info or you don't want to give it and so they said is Danica actually dead and her face was like yes she was like yes it's just funny these rapid fire answers is where it was funny to me that she was so surprised by some of the questions because she doesn't read our theories. She was like, why am I having to answer this? Like, I told you that she's dead. You know, it was funny. So they said, is Dan actually dead? She said, yes. She said going through that for Bryce was so extensive and like, so many things happened to Bryce after losing Danica. She said it would feel cheap to let her come back after all of that suffering. Like it was worth something, you know? Then they said, is Connor really dead? And she was like, Yes. <laughs> and then they said, does Emil actually have no powers? And she said, pass. Do mates or is the mating bond in Crescent City, does it mean the same thing as in Akatar? And she was like, she thought about answering it. And then she basically was like, I'll let you see, you know, I'll let you just keep reading it. And so she said, pass. Then they said, is Hunt Bryce's mate? And she stared at them for a minute, like, so confused and she said am i gonna am i like disrupting something by answering this and all of us are like um yes sarah some people are very passionate about this and she was like yes he's her mate like he is for sure her mate um and that's when i started screaming just because i did not expect some of these answers but then knowing that she doesn't know the theories that made sense to me that she was like yeah i already wrote that you know you should know that already but she said, yes, I wanted to kind of throw a wrench in everybody of like, oh, look, she has the same love interest the whole time. Look at me. I can do it. You know, it was funny. And then they were talking about keeping the secret of the crossover. And she said that that was really hard. But she said it was even harder to keep the secret um, between Akatar and Akomath. Um, with Fair Tamlin Reese. She said that was so hard. Like she described being on tour for Akatar, but of course writing and finishing Akomath and people coming up to her and saying, I love Tamlin so much. Like I love him. And she said, I would just be like, uh -huh. she said my voice went like four octaves higher because I couldn't say anything. So I was like, that is the ultimate, you know, we have all these memes and reels of us listening to our friend read it for the first time. And we can't tell them like, imagine being the writer. She was like, it was so hard. So she said that was the hardest secret for her to keep. Then they asked, how much of Bryce's power has she accessed? And she said, you'll find out in the next book. They asked her, they said, previously you did not say, you need to read Akatar before Crescent City. Are you standing by that or do you want to change that? And she said, yeah, I'll change it now. Like you should read Akatar first. Um, of course, nobody wants the spoiler to get out that it's a crossover, but it's hard People ask me this a lot and I try to be very vague um, because I really want them to get that boom experience at the end of Sky and Breath, just like I did. She said, yes, it would be better to read Akatar, especially between book two and book three, because she was like, if you read the end of book two and you don't 
want to read Avatar, like you probably shouldn't read book three. You know, she was like, if you get to this and you don't know these characters, you should go to know them and then look, read book three. They asked her about the cover of House of Flame and Shadow. They were basically were like, tell us about it. And she was like, I'm not saying anything. She said, I'm not saying anything about anything, which is her phrase. Um, but she was like, it is chock full of Easter eggs. She, you know, they do, they like have done in both of the covers previously. And so she said, this one has a ton. She said it's her favorite cover, maybe her favorite cover ever. Um, she said, usually she's intense about tweaking and it takes a lot of drafts, but she said she saw this one and she was like, this is beautiful. Like you can never top this. She's like, how, where do you even go from here? This is it. They asked her if she wrote Crescent City chronologically if it's linear and, or if she jumps around and she said yes she writes it chronologically she makes herself write it linear um because the ending is she already knows the ending all along and she said she it's like dangling a carrot you know that's her motivation to write the rest of it so she can write that scene um so she writes linear and then gets to write the ending and like loses her mind <laughs> so so she gave the example of book two she said i powered through the rest of the book so i could get to that scene because she knew it was coming and she said the same with silver flames she knew like nesta and the blood right like all of that kept her going for the rest of the book they asked her about some of her favorite scenes and just things from her books she said little things that she just loves small details and like big things so she talked about when hunt discovers jj the my little pony thing she thought that was so funny so she also told us that she collects vintage my little ponies herself sarah and so bryce got that from her own obsession she said like she's been in bidding wars for vintage my little ponies um she just loves them another favorite scene is bryce and danica at the drop she said it makes her cry every time she's like call me sentimental um but she said she believes in our darkest moments like in real life that we're not alone in the people that we love who aren't here with us, um, that they are with us and some there's something looking out for us. So she said she loves the opening of book two when they're like at a frat party and like <laughs> playing beer pong or something. Um, she said she loved that scene and the scene where Rune is like super stoned. <laughs> I don't even remember that, okay. She loved the first scene with the hind and Ethan and she loved the hind reveal. Like she said she loved that moment because she's a very emotional person. She says she cries a lot when she's writing and she feels everything so deeply. Um, but she thinks that's what helps make her books what they are, which I agree. But she said she cried when the hind revealed herself to Rune and then the the scene where Bryce is running down the hallway from Rigelus and the marble busts are exploding and things. She's like, she loved that. Which also it was great to get the pronunciation of some names. I feel like most of them I know now, but like Rigelus, I did not know. And I was like, oh, writing that down. They were talking about how they have past pages when they're editing um, and that now everything's digital, but she said she used to have past pages for her books and that she would have tear stains on them because she's so emotional when she's writing. Um, she liked having that physical reminder. She's like, even after reading it so many times, like in the writing and editing process, she's still moved by so many of the scenes. But she said like, she was like, this was great. I was like, you are all book people. Like we all get you. She was like, I know that they're figments of my imagination. She's like, I know that they are, but they feel so real to me. And I was like, so then they asked her just a couple more questions because they started running out of time. There were a few um, tangents that I didn't go over. Just like she talked about um, her son's kindergarten potluck and a couple of random things like that, which was it was enjoyable just to see like she's a real human being, you know. But they asked her, how does it feel to have a fandom that follows your work? They they made it sound like they had met her years and years ago and that she was a fangirl of them. And now they, now they are fangirls of her. And so they were like, how, how is it now that, you know, you have fangirls for you? And she was like, she, she pushed back on that. You know? She said like, no, no, there's, there is no ego here. Like she didn't want to say fandom. She's like, I don't like calling it fandom. Like I know each one of my readers are individual people and I'm so thankful for them. But she was like, she said, it's so beyond anything that I've ever hoped for myself. She said, I grew up as a fangirl of so many things. She described herself as a nerd in high school before being a nerd was cool. 
um, but she said it blows my mind that people connect with these characters and worlds because they mean everything to me um, she said I have a profound sense of gratitude every single hour of my life that I get to do what I love for a living because of the people who read my books she didn't want to say fandom she would not say it she said she's deeply appreciative of the joy and enthusiasm that's brought to the books and she said it's been very humbling a very humbling and moving thing to know that her books mean something to someone else and can inspire somebody. And then she told some stories about like approaching readers because you know she lives in New York City now again and so she has seen readers walking um, and like on the subway and stuff. This is one of my favorite things. This is so funny. She said that there was a girl walking on the street who had a tattoo and it was a mountain and three stars. And she was with her husband and she was like, I think that's an Akatar tattoo. And he was like, oh, okay, yeah. And she's like, go ask her. I just thought that was so funny. I'm like, that is 100% me. I would never do it myself. But you know, if I can get Jared to do it, I'm like, Jared, go ask her because he's not shy. So she made her husband go ask and it turned out funny because the girl's like sketched by her husband. She was like, what? Um, and then she was like, I wrote those books. And she said, I don't think she believed me. Uh, so that's funny. Ladies, men also, if Sarah J Mass approaches you on the street, you better believe her, okay? And just tell her thank you. <laughs> She talked about another story where she saw a guy on the subway reading Acomath and he was like in the last third of the book and she was like, what is he reading right now? You know, she was like, is he reading some spicy scene on the subway? Um, but she said she talked to him and he told her that he was reading it because his girlfriend was a fan of the series and she was like, that's a good dude. And I was like, loved it. And then the very last final question that we all were dying to know and I was not sure that she was going to tell us so I was dying. Now that Crescent City 3 is done, what are you working on now? And she said, I'm working on the next Akatar draft. And then my brain exploded. <laughs> she said, I'm working on the next Akatar draft and that is all I'll say. But then she said, um, I'll be working on it for the next million years you know she was exaggerating she didn't want to give us a time she just was like i'll be working on it forever um she's like basically for the next several months and she said like that was her day went wild getting ready for this kindergarten potluck because she was drafting akatar and she got into it and so i was like give us anything so she didn't give us anything else except that that's what's coming next and so mind blown but i was like adrenaline high all night I was like I should not have watched this live because I was I could not go to sleep um, but it was just so fun to watch and it was so good to hear from her and to get some of our big questions answered that I did not think she would answer I hope you enjoy the wrap up and we got some good information from Sarah I will be rereading definitely Crescent City 1 and 2 before House of Flame and Shadow comes out in January and you know I am dying to read Akatar again since Jared has been reading it but I can't share the book with him because he already takes so long I'm not gonna take it from him so um, but I'm for sure rereading Crescent City and I'll give you some updated thoughts and I'm gonna make some videos of recaps for that before the book comes out so I'm glad you're here and thank you for watching